Welcome everyone. Today I'm going to be discussing Runelite client scripts. Client scripts are small programs that run inside the old school client and they interact with interfaces. Client scripts are written by old school RuneScript developers and stored in the cache so they don't have to send an updated Java client to players every time they update interface code. Client scripts are composed of two parts, a header and a set of instructions. The header contains information needed for running the script such as a script ID. The instruction section contains the actual script's code. Don't worry about understanding these fully right now, this is just an introduction. You'll understand more when we actually get into writing a client script ourselves. So here's an example client script, you can see our header at the top with the ID and other information, and you can see below that are the instructions, the actual code for the script. Each instruction is referenced by a name, and optionally has an operand. This syntax is similar to most assembly languages. After a script is written, these instructions are then assembled into a binary format, as you can see below here. Runelite has a complete list of instructions, so I'll leave a link to that file in the description below. So now we're going to actually create a client script. We're going to start with the ID and the header right here. And we're going to pick our favorite number for this. 10,000 and... 73, I'll risk it for you. <laughs> it's important that the ID is over 10,000 so it doesn't conflict with any existing scripts. Next we're going to specify the int stat count, which is the number of integer arguments to our script. In this case, it'll be zero. Next, we're going to specify the string stat count, which, as you can probably guess, is the number of string arguments to our script. Next, we're going to specify the number of integer local variables. For this script, it's zero. And next, we're going to do the same thing for strings. Once again, we have zero string local variables. Now we're done with the header and can start actually writing code. We're going to start with sconst, which pushes the string constant to the stack. Oh, hi, modash. Uh, bye. Next, we're going to use icons to push an integer to the stack. In this case, we're pushing zero, which is the default chat message type. Next, we're going to use the chat send public instruction. This takes the string constant and the integer we push to the stack, and then sends a public message. And I know you may be thinking, I said client scripts are related to interfaces. What does chat send public have to do with interfaces? Well, this instruction exists because the chat box is an interface and needs to be able to send public chats. Therefore, it can use a client script to call chat send public. And finally, we're going to use the return instruction to exit from our script. So now we're going to add our script into the old school client. We're going to use RuneLite to do this. So go to the RuneLite client folder and go to source, main, and then scripts. And we're going to create a new file here that ends with .rs2asm. Scripts in this directory will automatically be assembled when we build the client and they'll be packaged together with it. So now we're going to add in the code we wrote earlier. So if we were to build the client now, our script would be included in the client, but we never tell our script to run, so we'll just do nothing currently. To fix this, we're going to call our script from another already existing script. It's not important which script we choose in this case, it will just affect when our own script runs. For this example, we're going to be picking the bank layout script, and this script runs every time the bank opens or does a relayout, so switching tabs or searching. So we're going to use the invoke instruction here, which is used to call another script. And we're going to give it our script ID, 10073. So now our own script will run every time we open the bank. So let's go test it out now. So we're going to test it out here by opening the bank. And if we close this, you'll see, woohoo, we got our script working. One second, I need to make a quick call. Bring, 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 bring. Uh, is this Adam, the main developer of RuneLite? Oh, it is? Perfect. I've made the only plugin players will ever need. I can't think of anything else they'd want. So you can just stop working. Oh, RuneLite doesn't need to be developed anymore. It's done. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, you're welcome, by the way. A Nobel Prize? I didn't even know you were authorized to offer that, and I don't know what category it would be under. But, yes, I'll gladly accept. I will see you in Sweden next year. Thank you. Bye, Adam. So cringy jokes that pro definitely should have been cut aside. Let's get into the technical breakdown of how client scripts work. I will be explaining the execution environment in which these scripts run, as well as the binary storage format. Client scripts run on a stack-based virtual machine within the old school client. This is not a full virtual machine that runs an operating system, something like Windows or Mac. This definition of virtual machine just means that it can run a set of instructions and perform some actions. If you want to look more into this topic, Java itself has bytecode and runs on a virtual machine. 
What's unique about the client script virtual machine is that it has two entirely separate stacks. One stack only used for integers and the other stack only used for strings. This means that when you pop an integer from the stack, it only looks at the integer stack. It doesn't look at the string stack at all. It doesn't matter how many strings you've pushed in between pushing that last integer, it only cares about the last integer that was pushed. And vice versa, this also applies to the string stack with pushing integers. However, all this means for coding client scripts is that you can push integers and strings in whatever order you want. So you can push a string first or you can push an integer first. It doesn't really matter since they're separate. Other than that, it doesn't affect client script coding at all. So if that's what you're focused on, don't worry about it too much. So now we're on to client script storage. Client scripts are stored in the cache, and if you want to disassemble the existing client scripts from old school RuneScape, you can use some code like this in RuneLite's cache module. But you may be asking, Jeremy, what is the actual binary format structure of these client scripts? I'm just dying to know. I can't take another second without knowing this. It's so important to me. For all, maybe two of you, maybe only one, maybe zero, I'll probably watch this video so it'll be at least one. Well boy oh boy do I have an answer for you. Let's get right into it. Each client script starts with a null terminated string. Usually this is the empty string. Then next we have a set of opcodes. Then we have data relating to the script header. And lastly we have switch data. The set of opcodes is the client script's code. It's the binary encoded format of the instructions like the ones we wrote earlier. The opcode section of the client script file is simply a list of opcodes. Each individual opcode will be in one of the three formats shown here. If the opcode is sconst, which has the code 3, then it is the opcode and then a null terminated string after it. If the opcode number is less than 100 and is also not return, which is 21, or popint, which is 38, or pop string, which is 39, then it's the second case here, where it's the opcode and then a 4 byte integer. Iconst, the instruction we use to push an integer to the stack, would fall into this category. Everything that does not fit into the above two categories is this last type, which is the opcode and then in one unsigned byte. Chat send public is an example of this. The switch section of the client script file contains a list of switch blocks. Each switch block is similar to a switch statement in Java, how it has multiple cases based on what the input value is. Each switch block starts with two bytes, saying how many cases there are, and then a list of the cases. Each switch case contains four bytes, which is an integer value, which is the key, the value to compare to, and also a program counter offset. This is the jump offset for where to start running code if the value matches. And that's all there is to it. Thanks for watching. If there's anything else you'd want me to cover, let me know in the description below. Have a great day. Bye.